So today we have James Horry of OpenCore. Uh, Horry or Horay? Horry, yeah. Horry. Yeah. Uh, he'll be talking about Docker uh, and Ferry, uh, a way to sort of interact with Docker from Python. Uh, yeah. So let's welcome James. Well, cool. thank you for being here. Um, so as a caveat, um, again, you know, I was mentioning to um, Tim that this is not necessarily a programming talk, but about all the machinery and infrastructure that you often need to do really interesting visualizations or data programming. So it's more about the systems that go along with that and some of the new technologies that have been coming out in the open source community to really try to automate and help um, developers like yourself and data scientists cope with this. Um, but really, it's about a story. And I like to tell this as a story about a developer who um, is getting into Python and data visualizations um, and wants to really share her results with the rest of the world and with other developers, and maybe is having a harder time than um, she really should, um, and talking about some of those solutions and why that's the case. And our story basically comes in three parts. That one is the story about where she's going to get started writing a Boca application, because she's a new Python programmer, and this seems like a great way to do it. And it's going to be followed by her discovery of a cool, cool tool called Docker, and we're going to go over why that's such a neat tool. And finally, we're going to talk about orchestration of various Docker containers, and that may, may not may not make sense to a lot of you until you go through some of these examples. And again, this is pretty high level, but certainly after the presentation, if you have questions about the implementation or how this actually works, you know, just feel free to ping me. And before I continue, I would like to point out that all the technical material for this presentation, including the examples, are on um, the following GitHub project page. That also has links to the various dependencies to get up and started. Um, you probably don't want to download Docker and the Vagrant, my Vagrant box right now, it's kind of large, it's a couple gigabytes. I'm sure Facebook's wireless infrastructure is pretty good, but we want to be kind of good neighbors, right? So we don't want to flood their network. So our story starts here. One day, our developer is approached by her team lead, and her team lead just asks, they work at a consulting company, says, hey, we have this new client, and they're really interested in um, data visualization, and we want you to do something around geospatial data. Being a relatively new Python programmer, she does some Googling and finds this project, the Boca project, and it looks really, really nice. In fact, you know, it has a lot of different type of graph types and geospatial types. She's originally a Java programmer, so this looks super exciting for her. So um, she decides, okay, this is the route that I'm going to go, right? Totally makes sense. But before she gets too far, she's beginning to think, okay, if I'm going to create a little demo application using Boca, I'll need some data. So what data should I use? Well, how about the US Census data? Why not? It's, you know, it's widely available, it's, um, it's free, it's pretty rich, it has a lot of geospatial information in it. Maybe she can do something like um, create a state-by-state -state map at a county level of median and per capita income across the United States. And then she can add different sort of graph types if you click on something. That would be an example of an application she could write using BOCA and the US Census. Well, how do you access the US Census? Well, luckily for her, um, the US Census provides a nice RESTful API to let you download this data. Um, you know, it's just a plain REST-based API. They don't provide any external clients, but that's not a problem. It looks pretty straightforward, the structure. You just give it a code that defines what data you want out of the system and some sort of geospatial context, what county and what state, for example. You know, unfortunately, it's not necessarily obvious to her exactly how to get these codes and what that means, but they do provide extensive documentation. So she clicks through that and she says, oh, yeah, you know what? Turns out for total median income across all population groups, that's DPO30062E. That's pretty obvious, right? Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily intuitive, but it's pretty straightforward. She doesn't really feel like typing all of that in over and over and over and over again. And she thinks this is a good opportunity to use Python and to get started um, downloading this information. So she just writes a simple Python function using requests and you know, does simple uh, JSON parsing on that data. 
Really the only tricky part, of course, since this is the US government, is that you don't give it a state name or a county name or anything like that. You have to provide them with codes, numeric codes. So does anybody know what um, code the state of Tennessee is? Probably not, you know, I think it's 25 or something like that. So she has to code that up, but it's not too big of a deal. And after she does that, she gets this really nice um, download of the data broken down. So this is mean, median, and per capita income broken down by counties and state, nice, you know, nicely formatted. And this you know, only took her an hour or so, you know, even though she's a new Python programmer, so great. And she's from Texas, so that's why she downloaded the data on Texas. And in Texas, she was just scanning this, and she sees, oh, look at that. Borden County over there has a pretty good uh, mean, median, and per capita income. I wonder where that is. So just for fun, she looked that up. It turns out it's basically out in the middle of nowhere. There are like 600 people that live in this county, but apparently they make a pretty good income, especially compared to the people in Brooks County who are not doing as well. OK, fine. So this is good, this is good. So she has a program um, to download some data, to format that data. She's off to a pretty good start with her demo. And now it's time to go ahead and install Boca, okay? Keep in mind that she's a new Python programmer. She hasn't gone through this process before. But she's smart, you know, and she Googles and everybody talks about, hey, go ahead and use pip. Sweet, okay. So she types in pip install Boca. And it starts printing a bunch of stuff to the screen. She's like, oh, that's fantastic. I'll let it do its thing. I'm go going to grab some coffee, and I'll come back. And after a few minutes, she comes back, and she sees this funny error or something about python.h and compiling. And she's like, OK, I guess that's not good. Why I have to worry about header files in Python? I don't really understand this. But um, you know, at least it gives me a nice suggestion. Try to install Python dev, not in pip, of course. Just install it somehow using your favorite package manager, which for her, she's using Ubuntu. So she says, OK, app cache search, Python dev. Hi, look, I found it. Go ahead and install that and rerun pip install. And everything's going fine. Again, lots of stuff printing out to the screen. It's chugging along. She's like, OK, we're going to get this working. And then she gets this really messed up error from GCC, of all places, something about CC1 plus and no such file. And she's like, what the crap is this? I just want to get some plot. <laughs> and she has no idea what this means, so she turns to Google. right? She copies this and has something about uh, installing G++. OK, so she needs to install G++. And she's kind of getting frustrated. She's like, I'm using Python. Jeez, why? I've installed like all these header files and now G++. But she goes ahead, installs that, reruns pip install, and bam, she has Boca. It installed. Success, right? She can move forward. So she writes a super simple Python script, right, to just import the Boca library. That's all it does, those two lines. She got this from the example web page, right? It's, not, you know, just import those libraries. And she hits go, she hits run, Python run, and now she gets another error. It's like, oh, the sample data directory doesn't exist. Just run this command first. Run it where? And why, why do I need to run this? But she's like, okay, this is clearly a Python error, so I'm gonna go into the Python repo, you know, import this and go ahead and say boca.sampledata.download. And in fact, it just downloads some data packages for her, right? And finally, she can do that import statement again and get a Boca application written, OK? This is a pretty simple example. But even here, it's been a pretty frustrating process for her. It's taken a long time. But OK, she's pretty intrepid, and she moves forward. And let's fast forward, and she eventually gets a nice plot.py example written that can take the down data downloaded from the US Census, formats it correctly, uses Boca to create this nice geospatial map of the median income across counties. She's really tired of staring at Texas, so she does Kentucky just for fun, and this is what she gets. OK, great. Now she has some sort of demo. Just for fun, that red area means highest per capita income, and that's Louisville. That's the largest city in Kentucky. The orange and yellow spots are other major metropolitan areas. It's not so happy to live here, though. You know, 
It's not that densely populated, kind of poor. So yeah, that's Louisville right there. And you know, this, this is good, right? So she has this demo working and everything's going really well and people kind of like her demo. And she gets this uh, email from her team lead that asked her to create this demo. And the team lead says, hey, this looks fantastic. Let's give this demo to our client. You know, just wrap these, throw these HTML pages in a Flask app so we can serve it up. But by the way, um, we're trying to save money so you can't go. But I'll go. You just transfer your application to my laptop and I'll give the demo. I mean, what could, what could go wrong? It's a super simple app. It only took you like four or five hours from scratch to do this, right? And she's thinking, yeah, right, what could go wrong? And she begins thinking, OK, I, I need to recreate this environment, right? But at least I went through these steps. I'll just look through my bash history, and I'll just stick that into my bash file. And it's going to look kind of like this. OK, and of course, I have to type these in the right, right order and so forth. And you know, it's, it's kind of short. You know, it didn't feel this short when she was running it, but you know, it's not that complex. And she emails him this bash file or uploads it to their Git repo or whatever. And he's like, OK, great. And he runs it. And he's like, the conversation that ensues goes something like this. Oh, yeah, your script didn't work. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Something funny printed to the screen. I have no idea why. Uh, yeah, I typed that. Oh, OK, I'll do it as pseudo. No, it still didn't work. It's like, wait, what? What am I running? I'm running Red Hat. You know, that's the official um, you know, image that we're supposed to run. Why are you running Ubuntu? Why don't you just walk over to my office and just fix this? Because I have to leave like in 30 minutes. And she's like, oh, crap. So, but she, you know, she walks over and she fixes it, and she goes through the whole process again on his machine. You know, instead of apt-get, it's yum, and the packages are called a little bit different, and a few more errors. But after an hour or so, you know, it's running, sweet. And so the team lead gives that demo. It was a huge success, and she gets to keep working on this project and develop it into a full application. And he says, as part of that, if you can make sure that the other developers on our team and with our clients can also download the app once in a while and run it because we may want to give additional demos, right? That would be great. And she's thinking, yeah, this is great. So now I might have to go through this process again, sharing the same application as I develop it. You know, should be easy, but not as easy as you know she would like. So. As she's thinking about this, she's procrastinating and she's reading stuff on Hacker News and she sees this thing about Docker, this project called Docker. She doesn't really know what it's about, but everybody's talking about it. Um, she visits, you know, has a cute icon, uh, you know, who could not like that icon? And she goes to the GitHub page and it's like, holy crap, this thing has over 10,000 GitHub stars and it's only you know, six, nine months old. It, this thing must be awesome. I don't know what it is, but it must be awesome. So she digs a little deeper. And she learns that, in fact, Docker is addressing the exact same problem that she has right now. It's a way to fully encapsulate the runtime environment in a set of lightweight, quote, containers. And basically, the end result of this is that it makes it easy and safe to reproduce that runtime environment or, and to ship her entire application as a binary image of some sort. And it's super easy to get started. And she thinks, OK, this is what I'm going to use. So how do I get started? Well, she goes through the various tutorials, and she runs the equivalent of, of Hello World. I'm not going to show you this. It's pretty straightforward. You can go to docker.io and look at that. But really, the um, heart of the matter comes down to what they call the Docker file. Now, for those that have used Vagrant, it's kind of like your Vagrant file, except if you look at this, what you would notice is that it's a lot simpler. Basically, think of the Docker file as her bash script in a slightly more controlled, sane manner. So you take the bash script and append various commands like run and add that have very obvious meanings. Run means run this in the container. Add means add this to the container. And the statements are run from top to bottom. So let's look at this. First, she has to choose a base image. This is the image that her container starts with from a clean install. 
It's as if you just took this base image, had it on your own machine, and nothing else installed. That's the base image. She likes Ubuntu. She's going to go with 12.04 since that's what she's using. And that name statement up there, that's a very specific thing. Docker is going to ignore that, but it's kind of nice, I think, to name your containers. Then she's going to install everything, the dependencies. At this point, she knows that she has apt-git. She knows exactly what's on this environment, and she can just run these commands. Pretty straightforward, nothing too complex. She's kind of cleaned up her script since this time, so she just adds a bunch of these files into her container. And then finally, she needs a default command. This means that when you start the container, I want the following script or whatever command in there to be run. She just wrote a shell script to start her web server to start serving out her HTML pages. Then what she's going to do is build this container using the docker build command. And then you know, the whole build process, most of that time, is probably going to go towards just installing this, you know, the, the app get part. If it's going to compile a bunch of stuff, that will take some time, but it's really not that bad. And once that image is built, she can then push that image onto Docker IO's public um, index server. And what that means is she can push that image onto a server where other people can then download that image. It's kind of like, if you, again, if you use Vagrant, it's kind of like creating a Vagrant box and pushing it out to a public Vagrant server except it's free, you know, the Docker people um, kindly has given us the ability to upload open source images for free, which is awesome. So thanks, Docker team. Now she's done this, so this is pretty awesome. So what's the next step? Now, the whole point of this exercise was for her colleagues and her team lead to be able to pull her application or to demo her application. So all they have to do is type in those two commands. Assuming they have Docker installed on their Linux box, this is becoming easier and easier. Red Hat officially supports Docker now in their long-term server release, same with Ubuntu. It's becoming pretty straightforward. And once they have Docker installed, all they have to do is say Docker pool, my image name. That goes through a download process, and then they can just run that container. The only weird part is that dash p flag. That's just a port forwarding mapping. That's all it is. But basically, they're just saying run that container. And this is just a visual illustration to show you that that container is running on top of your host operating system. Okay? And I'll talk, tell you about the consequences of that in just a little while. But the nice thing is that as soon as um, your colleague goes through those commands and runs that command, all they have to do is open up their browser, go to port 8000 or whatever other port you map, and they're going to see the exact same thing that she saw when she uploaded that image. And in fact, everybody will. It will be exactly reproduced in, in their environment, which is pretty awesome. And in fact, you can do something crazy like run this image multiple times. And each time you run that image, that image believes, that container believes, it owns that complete environment. It's completely isolated. So in technical parlance, what's going on is Docker is using technologies like Linux containers, AUFS, and process remapping so that it looks like each time you run it, it's almost as if it gets its own virtual environment or virtual machine. It's very similar you know, qualitatively to doing that. Except each time someone hits that run command, it takes about one second to actually go ahead and start that. So compared to a more traditional method using virtual machines, yes, you can end up in the same state, but it's just going to be a lot slower and a lot heavier. And because the Linux kernel is really just doing some clever process and namespace isolation, the overhead from using a Docker container is super low. In fact, I would pretty much challenge anyone to actually notice the amount of CPU and memory overhead associated with Docker containers. Basically, it's like running a native process. So you get all the pros of running in an isolated environment, like using virtual machines, with almost none of the cons. There are some caveats, though. This is based on Linux. It doesn't run natively on OS X or Windows. And so, you know, it's a little bit more restrictive. But if you are in that environment, it's really, really nice. And just FYI, if you do have Docker running and you don't mind downloading some stuff, 
you can just type in these commands right now into your terminal and you should get this demo up and running because this is real demo, right? You can do that. It's going to be about a few hundred megabytes or so. So, okay, great. So she has a demo. She can share her demo with her colleagues in a reproducible way. It's kind of looking professional and her team lead comes up to her and says, you know what, this is really awesome. Why don't we take this demo and develop it and make it into an application that we can sell? Because, you know, I think our consulting company should really be a software company because that's how you scale and make lots of money. You already have a demo, so what's the big deal, right? I mean, just kind of build off of this. And she's thinking, you know, that, okay, fine. This sounds like an awesome suggestion, so where do we get started? First, we need more data. You know, this amount of data is not interesting. More U.S. Census data. They have, you know, um, tens of gigabytes of data. Maybe we can get daily weather data across zip codes and counties from Weather Underground. Maybe we can get geotag tweets. We can take all this data, sell it as a business marketing platform, and businesses will pay us to access this clean data. It's going to change the world. It's going to be awesome, and I'm going to become super rich, and Docker is going to help me do this. But wait, before we get there, she's thinking, OK, with all this data, we probably need a database at this point. Storing them in CSV files, yeah, probably not going to cut it for our startup. So what database? Well, it's going to be a highly scalable you know, database because you know, my startup, her startup, is going to be super successful. We're going to have a million users tomorrow, so we need to think about scale. So why not use Cassandra? Hey, Cassandra was developed here at Facebook, so we know it's scalable. Thanks, Facebook, you're awesome. You know, you give us a bunch of awesome tools. And the way Cassandra works is that you have all of these machines numbered one through seven, and they're logically ordered in a token ring, basically. And the idea is that as you send a bunch of writes and perform a bunch of reads, we're going to select some subset of those machines to execute those commands. And you can keep adding machines. It's super simple. You can even take away machines, so super fault tolerant. And Cassandra just seems like a very nice database to use. But it seems a little complex. I mean, just look at this diagram. It, she kind of wishes there were only like three boxes instead of 10 boxes. But is it complex? Well, it turns out that it's not so bad. Once upon a time, it is true that Cassandra and other scalable databases like HBase use terminology that no one else understood. They use weird words like super column and column family and rows that actually weren't rows. And, you know, that's kind of conflated issues. But more recently, um, the people on the, in the Cassandra community and companies like Datastax have come up with a language called CQL, which is basically like SQL except for Cassandra. And in order to start modeling your data, you create something like this. You know, this looks pretty familiar to those that use relational databases. You create a table, you specify their types. This part's a little weird. This is a compound key, but not too big of a deal. It's not too much of a jump. So she thinks, OK, this is great. I'm going to use Cassandra. So how do we get started? Well, she has a couple different options. She can shove all of these. Um, she can shove all of these dependencies in her single Docker file, including the Cassandra dependency. She can install it in her Docker file and run that and build that. You know, that's the pros to that are that it's pretty simple. Or she can try to begin orchestrating that. So let's look at these options. So yeah, she's basically dealing with simple versus flexible. And at the end of the day, she begins thinking, well, you know what? I don't really want to build and maintain a dozen Docker files, especially the Cassandra Docker file. I'm not a Cassandra expert. I don't really want to be a Cassandra expert. Maybe there's a better way to do this. And it turns out that, of course, lots of people have written Docker images that you can find on the Docker index. That's great. She should reuse those. But that means now she has to begin thinking about how to orchestrate these various Docker services, which is kind of a pain. But she thinks, not a problem. I'll just write a shell script that pulls the images, then starts this database, then this database, and make sure the IP address of this goes into that. And she's like, wait, wait. We've been down this road before. Bash scripts suck. 
I am not doing this again. Docker help me fix this problem. I am not going down this route again. It's not as bad this time, admittingly, but it's still not a, an optimal situation. So she begins thinking, hey, is there a better way to do this? Luckily for her, there is a better way to do this. Fairy is one approach. And basically what Fairy lets her do is to specify the entire runtime environment, both the front end and back end, in a single YAML file. Okay, And she can say, I want a Hadoop cluster or a Cassandra cluster, and I want these Docker containers attached to them automatically. Okay, That's all it, all it does. And so the way I kind of think of Fairy and other orchestration tools is it's almost like PIP, Okay, where in PIP you get to specify all the various things it depends on, and you expect the system to handle it for you. I'm doing the same thing except for lots of services in your runtime environment. So this is the Ferry homepage. Definitely check it out. You know, there are some nice installation um, procedures. And if you're running OS 10, there's actually a Ferry Vagrant box that you can just init and download. It's like a three gigabyte box, so be warned. So what does her application look like at this point? Basically, there are just two elements. The top one is her YAML file. This is a super simple example where she says, I want a Cassandra cluster. I just want to use this over one instance. You, she can actually change that and specify 100 instances. It's not a big deal. The reason why you would want to do that on your laptop, create a 100-node virtual, 100 virtual cluster, is that Cassandra and other tools like Hadoop lets her control how data is distributed across these machines. And it's not trivial to test this in a non-production environment, but Fairy lets her do that because these are all virtual nodes, even though they're running in a distributed manner, and they're all lightweight. She also wants a client. She's just going to call it the Pi Data Cassandra client to expose port 8000. She also needs to rejig her Docker file that she originally had, and it's not too different. The only differences are one that she needs to base it from the Fairy Cassandra client that makes sure that she has the right uh, drivers installed. And there are some locations of some of these scripts that need to be moved so that they're started in the right order with respect to Cassandra. That's really not too different from her original um, Docker file. And then that's it. So now, assuming she has Fairy installed and she's written these YAML files in this new Docker file, she just needs to point Fairy to her new YAML file, say start, and it's going to go ahead and automatically um, um, configure and configure in, uh, the Cassandra cluster and make sure that client can connect to that cluster all automatically. So all the configuration happens for her. And this process for Cassandra, even when we're talking dozens of virtual nodes, usually takes about 10 seconds. Something like Hadoop is actually a little bit more complicated, may take 20 or 30 seconds. But that's it. And the best part is, just like Docker, she can start multiple virtual clusters and Fairy is going to manage that for her. So here is just one, but you know, usually in my development, I'll usually have a dozen clusters or so running on my laptop. She can also, just for fun, SSH into one of these connectors. These connectors are just regular Docker containers, but she can SSH into it, and if she does a PS, oh look, her web server is actually running and being exposed on port 8000. So at the end of the day, it doesn't look too different from her original Docker demo. You still, it's still the same web application. You still access it the same way, except this time it's actually being backed up by a Cassandra cluster, which is pretty nice. So she, so what, she begins wondering, what's actually going on when you do start? For Cassandra, it's actually pretty simple. In this example, we're starting two Cassandra nodes. Basically, those are the, the yellow boxes. Um, Fairy is going to stand up these containers, build them automatically. These are just Docker containers. Um, automatically generate the configuration files necessary for those two nodes to talk to each other, and then also automatically um, configure the client to be able to talk to those connectors. And of course, you know, afterwards, she can look at the environment, em environment variables, and Ferry is kind enough to point her to the right IP addresses so that she can begin interacting with, those, um, with that Cassandra cluster. So what if she wanted to do something more, exam uh, more complex? So in this example, what she's going to do is start a cluster file system, a cluster FS parallel file system. This is basically like NFS, except where the data is distributed over multiple machines. It was kind of funny. I think in one of yesterday's talks, 
Um, face, it turns out that Facebook uses Cluster, which is pretty awesome. And she also wants to instantiate a, uh, the compute part of Hadoop. It's called Yarn, basically, to operate over that data in Cluster file system. Well, it turns out that you can just write a YAML file for this. Let's just call it Yarn, and you can just start it. And even though what Ferry has to do to get this running is more complex, there are more containers, the configuration management is a bit more complex, and it's a little bit slower to get started, from her perspective, it looks exactly the same. You start it, you can SSH into the connectors, and you can download and configure it however you want. And afterwards, you can just shut it down. And Cassandra and, and Ferry is going to automatically clean up all the resources you know, exactly as you would expect. Now, at this stage, let's take a step back and think about what she's accomplished, right? So she has this awesome demo. It's hitting Cassandra. It's looking pretty good. And she begins thinking, well, what do I need to do at this stage? Well, wouldn't it be nice if she could get some feedback from the wider development community on GitHub or wherever on, on her progress, right? And maybe there are some other applications that other people would like to share as well. But there's not an obvious way to do this for these very applications. But luckily for her, this is a feature that's going to come out relatively soon. If you buy me beer, it might come out sooner. But basically, I'm going to let her upload her containers and her configuration files to OpenCore server. And that way, you can do something like share this image and then pull an entire application stack locally on your machine. So after she pushes her demo um, online, you can then just pull that, and you'll also get the exact same um, Cassandra cluster with all the same data and so forth running, which is pretty nice, for, and it gives a lot of valuable feedback. But of course, at the end of the day, she wants to make some money, which really means she needs to take this demo and her application and deploy it at scale. Right? Because it's one thing to run it on your laptop for development. You have to get it live and running. So wouldn't it be great if she could just do this all within Ferry? She really doesn't want to go out and purchase this service from th that company and this service from that company and you know, do this from AWS and so forth. Well, it turns out that she can do this. If she wanted to sign up for a, um, to be one of my beta users, she could type the following command. If she has her application written, all she has to do is say, deploy this. She just needs to provide Ferry with her AWS credentials, and every single one of her containers is going to be automatically translated into a full-blown virtual machine. The same configuration, everything that she installed in her web client, whether she compiled something or did an app get download, whatever, is going to be automatically in her EC2 environment. And then afterwards, she can continue managing the application using Ferry. So she can still stop it, restart it, snapshot it, and so forth, except it's actually running at scale. So that's pretty neat. And so this concludes our story for now. And, you know, I kind of like to think of this as a story that of a developer who really was just getting into Python and development and somehow accidentally ended up being the CTO of an awesome startup around, you know, Docker and Python. But along the way, she's learned some valuable lessons that I think is, speaks true for many of us. That one, even running and installing simple applications, in this case a Boca application, um, can be complex, and certainly maintaining that runtime environment is just not fun. Two, Docker solves largely a lot of these problems if you're running in a single environment. Okay, if, you, if you're willing to deal with single containers, it largely solves this problem. So if you're not using Docker now, download Docker, install it, and begin using it. You will thank me later. It is awesome. But at the same time, Docker doesn't solve all these problems because ultimately, like anything, you still have to deal with orchestration across runtime services now. And fortunately for her, there are many open source tools that are being you know, um, brought up right now to help solve this problem. Ferry is not the only one. Ferry focuses on big data stacks and big data orchestration, but there are many other tools. So luckily for her, she can just choose which one makes sense for her. So thank you for paying attention. I'm James Horry. Um, that's my email. Feel free to email me. 
Um, visit the fairy.opencore.io website. Go ahead and install Fairy. There's a simple Vagrant box. It's fun to use. And if you have any questions, you can email me or send me a tweet. Thanks. Yeah, that was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, uh, what happens to the state of the container when you make some changes after you SSH into it? Like, um, uh, do, can you save it? What? Yeah. So um, there's a Docker answer and there's a Perry answer, and they're mostly the same. If you're just using a plain Docker container, one, you can't just SSH into it. You have to start the SSH server and all that stuff. But if you could, um, if you stop the container and restart it, your state is basically saved. And that's true in Fairy as well. Um, if you want to persist those changes across reboots, right, or after an upload, um, both Docker and Fairy come with specific commands to snapshot that data or can create a new container based off of that. So my suggestion is, you know, especially dealing with Docker, is once you're in that container, if you're making lots of changes and you want to save that, go ahead and save that as a new container. And Ferry, go ahead and snapshot, snapshot that stack. Yeah. Over here. So um, at the risk of being that guy, can yeah. I ask about cross platforminess in the sense that you look around and everyone's using a Mac, and then we have to go into our virtual machine. And then yeah. I'm worried about the sort of turducken aspect of, uh, of all this. Yeah. Um, is there, is there any sort of hope for being able to have these kind of universal Docker, universal fairy files? Yeah, so that's actually a really, really great question. Um, you know, this is a really contentious issue on the, in the Docker community. Um, right now, Docker is only natively supported on the Linux kernel, plus some BSD kernels. No one, it turns out no one cares about BSD kernels, but it's fine. Um, so in theory, it could be supported on OS X, right? Um, assuming that um, Apple continues to patch their kernel and makes those native capabilities available. When that happens, I don't really know. Um, I don't believe it's really um, on the uh, Docker roadmap for any time soon, which really means, unfortunately, that Fairy, since it relies on Docker underneath, won't run natively in those environments. Having said that, the recommended way of going about running this on OS X or Windows is basically use Vagrant or create a virtual machine image. Um, one thing that I'm playing around with uh, with Fairy is creating an online hosted service. So chances are I'm just going to create a Fairy box that's just constantly running. So if you wanted to just play around with Fairy and play around with Docker, you know, just shoot me an email and I'll give give you an account you can SSH into that and begin playing around with that. But that's kind of a cop out answer. Unfortunately, I don't know, but that's definitely something that I hope is addressed in the near future. Yeah. Uh, Docker runs on Mac sort of with the, you know, the with boot to Docker. Kind of, yeah, yeah, the the virtual machine server sort of thing that they have. Does Ferry work with that on like kind of natively on a Mac using that kind of indirection layer? Yeah, so the answer is no. And the reason why is that the official way of running Docker on OS X is to use an image called boot to Docker. It's just a minimal Linux image that runs on a virtual machine, you know. Um, it's kind of like a vagrant box. But the last time I checked, it's a 32-bit image, and Docker requires a 64-bit Linux image. As soon as boot to Docker becomes natively 64-bit, then the answer will be yes. Um, if you already have Docker installed, by the way, the easiest way to use Fairy is to run Fairy inside of Docker. So it's way too many nests, but you can do that, which is crazy. So you can spin up a Linux VM, install Docker, run Fairy in Docker to spin up other Docker containers in the Docker container. It actually kind of works, which is amazing, but yeah. Okay, we should yes, sir. We should probably call it soon. Maybe one more quick question. Um, do you envisage that Ferry might become somewhat of a supervisor um, for those orchestrations so that 
you know, the, the absence of upstart inside of the Docker container kind of gets um, solved? Yeah, you know, I think, I think that's a really tall order to solve the orchestration problem completely. You know, what I've seen is that different orchestration methods are targeting different sort of communities. So the web community has their own particular needs around queues and things like that, whereas the big data community has slightly different needs. Whether that kind of converges into a single orchestration system for containers like Docker, um, yeah, I think so, but it might be quite some time before we see that. Um, but in the meantime, I think it makes more sense to focus on the needs of very specific communities. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, that was great. Let's give James another hand. We'll be back in a few minutes.